Hey Spookies, I wanted to take a quick moment to introduce this very special episode of Rick or Treat Horrorcast. The new off-Broadway production of Teeth the Musical is currently in previews and set to open on March 12th, running through March 31st here in New York City. The team at Playwrights Horizons has graciously and enthusiastically collaborated with the podcast to provide coverage of this exciting new musical. This week's episode will feature a bit of a different format than usual and will run a little longer than more recent episodes, but for very good reason. I'll be sharing interviews with Teeth the Musical's writers and composers, Tony and Pulitzer Prize winner Michael R. Jackson and award winner Anna K. Jacobs, as well as the film Teeth's writer and director Mitchell Lichtenstein. And then I'm going rick-or-treating with my very good friend, activist and artist Evelyn DeVere. A quick note about the content of this episode. I generally choose not to include trigger warnings on the podcast, as the horror genre deals with sordid and complicated subject matter, and frankly, different things trigger different people. That said, if you're curious or apprehensive about the topics we'll be discussing, I recommend checking out DoesTheDogDie.com or any other number of reputable websites that provide information about the contents of sensitive media. Also, if you're in New York, Nighthawk Cinemas in Williamsburg, Brooklyn will be holding a screening of Teeth in celebration of the new musical adaptation, and the post-show Q&A will be moderated by yours, Ghoulie. Join as I take a bite out of Teeth with the writer-director of the film and the musical's composers. You don't want to miss this. Information on where to get your tickets for both the musical and the screening of the film can be found in the show notes. Lastly, in addition to this podcast episode, check out my interview with Michael and Anna on RueMorgue.com for even more insight into their creative process for putting this musical together, and keep an eye out for my upcoming review of the show. With that said, and with special thanks to Playwrights Horizons for arranging this episode, let's go rick-or-treating. Hello, spookies, and welcome to Rick or Treat Horror Cast, hosted by yours, Ghoulie, Ricky J. Duarte. This week, I have some incredible guests on this very special episode of the pod. Now, I recently had a Tony nominee on the show, but this episode features a Tony winner and a Pulitzer Prize winner to boot. Michael R. Jackson won the 2022 Tony Award for Best Book of a Musical and the Pulitzer Prize for his profound, earth-shaking musical, A Strange Loop. Anna K. Jacobs' musical Pop about the murder of Andy Warhol won three Connecticut Critics Circle Awards and seven Helen Hayes Awards. She also wrote Stella and the Moon Man and Harmony Kansas. Now together, they've adapted the 2007 horror dark comedy Teeth for the stage in a new musical comedy with book and music by Anna K. Jacobs and book and lyrics by Michael R. Jackson, premiering February 8th as part of Playwrights Horizons 2003-2024 season. Please welcome to the show, Michael R. Jackson and Anna K. Jacobs. Hello, Ricky. Hey, Ricky. Hi, hi. I, I am so excited to speak with both of you. I'm such an admirer of both of your work. You are very accomplished artists. And so it means a lot to me to take the time to be on this show. I actually, I just realized all three of us use our middle names initial <laughs> <laughs> professionally. Do we dare reveal what they stand for? Sure. I mean, yes. Michael, you go first. Um, Ramon. Ooh. Uh, Catherine. Catherine. And I'm a Joseph. I say this with, I say mine with the caveat that Anna Jacobs is a very beloved Western Australian romance novelist. Great. So we're throwing that K in there to differentiate. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would love to talk about this musical that y'all are working on. This is a wild concept to me. Before we get to that, I would love to know what is your relationship with the horror genre? Um, for me, I... A typical, I sort of historically always was like very stressed out by horror movies, but I would go to them anyway. And in sort of the last couple of years, I, I'm working on a horror film, or an original horror concept for a film. And so I'd sort of been throwing myself into the horror genre, sort of full throttle. So I'm, I'm really, I'm like all in on horror at this point. 
I'm somebody who has an extremely low terror threshold <laughs> and can barely sit through like five minutes of a horror movie. Um, I just find it so overwhelming but and I have a hyperactive imagination but when I went and saw Sweeney Todd the musical Mm. um, for the first time I realized how much I loved horror on stage partly because there's a little bit of distance between you and the performers and I realized that was my way into the genre. That's the quintessential like perfect horror theater experience i absolutely love that show it's funny it's scary it's brilliant music i think it's a great way to blend the two genres great i'm glad that that was kind of a a great like profound experience for you when when were you both first introduced to the film teeth um i first encountered it in 2009 i think it was um a director i then working with shared it with me and i sort of was taken with it Michael brought the project to me and so that was when I first watched the film and um, I don't know I was in my 20s and I, I it never occurred to me that it would be a particularly racy piece to adapt for the mm. musical theatre stage but I've since learned that other people think that. I have to say I, I saw the film when it was released and now revisiting it post me too it hits very differently what adjustments were made to accommodate today's cultural and social awareness um i mean to be honest like for me i sort of think that i i don't know that we i mean we've made adjustments to it but i don't think that we made adjustments in light of that Mm. um you know certainly in the making of it Mm -hmm. we're aware of those things so that like nobody involved in performing it uh, runs into any issues of abuse but the story inherently sort of has elements that are sort of that run afoul of of, the social norms and what's proper behavior and all of that but uh I can't I don't think I don't I haven't been thinking of like oh we have to respond to me too Mm -hmm. by doing this or that in the story I think for me, um, like to echo Michael, I don't know whether our approach to the content of our musical changed because of what was happening around us culturally, but I do think that my own perspective shifted throughout Mm. that period. Um, I think that like when I initially started working on this project with Michael, I was seeing things through quite a personal lens and then me too sort of exploded my understanding of um of how this was so much more pervasive than i was aware and it, it made me understand how the piece would resonate differently than i was initially anticipating mm. when and how did the decision to adapt this film into a musical occur and how did the two of you begin working with one another on it well after you know shortly after seeing the film i just sort of thought that it might be a good idea for a musical and I knew that it wasn't a musical that my I didn't think I didn't feel that I had the musical voice for it and Anna was somebody whose music I had had long admired and um and I felt felt that it was important that I have a female collaborator on it and so I approached her about it to see you know what her take was and if it was of any interest to her and and the conversation sort of began there yeah michael and i met each other at graduate school at nyu and um we weren't we didn't go through the program at the same time but we became acquainted with each other's work through the program and um and like he said we just became fellow admirers of each other's work and i sort of just wanted to write with Michael so I would have gone whole in on anything (laughs) that he brought to me this this was it I love that I absolutely love that I you know revisiting this film was watching it recently and knowing that it was you know had been adapted into a musical I was seeing beats and I was seeing moments where I was like oh this is going to be great on stage this is absolutely a moment for the perfect song or wow I can't wait to see how this is adapted wait Ricky what's one of the moments you thought 
want to know. All right. So this is going to sound dumb, but when they go to the movie theater and they're like, oh, this one's rated R. We can't go see that. Uh huh. And then uh, the gynecologist scene. I can't wait to see <laughs> what happens there because that's I had forgotten how wild that scene is. It's a song. Great. It's become a song. <laughs> <laughs> that's terrific. The writer and director of the film, what was his reaction when he was approached to uh, his film being turned into a musical? Um, I think pretty positive. I don't remember the initial response, but he like was, you know, he let us like pursue the right. So, and he was, he's been very supportive at every step. Like he's come to pretty much almost every reading or workshop that we've done. Um, so he's been great. And he's been generous in terms of giving us a lot of creative rope as we sort of worked through the material and found our own ways in. He wasn't uh, prescriptive about how we do our adaptation, which meant that we could really, you know, personalize our approach to it, which was great for us artistically. Yeah. And also Mitchell is an independent filmmaker. Mm -hmm. So I think he, on a level, really understood us as you know these two writers who at the time we had no attachment to producers or anything and we were just making this because we're passionate about it and I think he really got that that's excellent a majority of my guests on the show are independent filmmakers uh, how did y'all get involved with Playwrights Horizons I know there were workshops and there was a concert at 54 Below what uh where how did you get to this point um I mean, I had a pre-existing relationship with Playwrights Horizons because that's where the world premiere of A Strange Loop was. So that was one connection. I don't remember when they specifically got involved with Teeth, though I'm sure it's because partially through Associate Artistic Director Natasha Sinha, I'm sure had seen workshops of it. Um, and they had been at a workshop that we had done last year, for sure. Um, so I think around there. Do either of you have a favorite moment in the show? Just one? <laughs> uh, no, as many as you want. <laughs> I mean, there's so many for me. One that I, that's an odd one, and it's not one that you'll you'll know because it's not based on anything in the movie. Mm. We sort of have greatly expanded and reinterpreted the character of Brad, Don's stepbrother. Mm -hmm. There's a moment that, and we've also done that with, his father and Don's stepfather. And there's a moment that happens between the two of them that for me was, is really, is scary and haunting and emotional. And it can, it has all the elements um, of a horror. I think of the show as having sort of being horror within a horror in a way mm. because of the sort of the world that it's drawing from. And that moment for me, a, a song moment uh, called Real Man is one that has really been resonating with me. Today, on Thursday, my favorite moment might be uh, the the lake scene between Dawn and Toby, which is the first time that Dawn emasculates somebody. Mm -hmm. um, the way that it's being staged is incredibly spooky and haunting. And I love the way that the the text and the music are interacting in that moment in a way that, I think is kind of unexpected and very um, tense and really speaks to the horror of the musical. And I think my other favorite moment actually is a, is a, it's a number that falls quite late in the show. And it actually like, it goes beyond the point where the film ends. Mm. Um, Michael and I actually take the narrative of our show further than the film does. And um, it's, it's a number called Dentata, but I feel like that's all I should say, say without giving away some good spoilers. Don't spoil anything because I, I cannot wait for that moment. I love that you expounded on what is already there. I feel like the ending of the film is so bittersweet because she smiles and she finds this empowerment, but also it's like, damn, like that's what life is for her moving forward, you know? So I'm, I'm curious to see right. what, what might happen after that moment. So my theory is that horror is a genre that can showcase situations and stories in a way that is both fantastical, but very relatable. What is it about musical theater that is able to amplify a story like Teeth? Well, I'll jump in. I mean, I feel like horror deals with the supernatural and I think musical has magical elements to it. You know, mm -hmm. there are things you can do 
with music that allows an audience to suspend their disbelief. You can manipulate time. You can make something that's abstract feel concrete. Um, you can take an emotion that's just part of a fabric of different emotions and you can completely blow it up and bring it to the foreground. So I think the the sort of, yeah, the magical powers of music um, really lend themselves to horror. Yeah, I would echo all of that. That's a great answer. I'm going to ask this question really selfishly because my listeners know I'm writing a queer punk horror musical screenplay. And it's ref like reflective of my own lived experience. What advice do you have for writing a horror musical? Um, well, for me, I something I've been really meditating on, both in working on this and on the sort of the, the horror screenplay I'm working on, is I believe that horror is when something you're afraid of comes true. And so I would just encourage young writers to really think about what is the thing that you're afraid of or that you want to portray? Like, what is the real the real thing and that come, then comes true? Mm. Like, in sort of mapping out what reality is on either side of that thing. That's brilliant because it is a genre where we dig deep and and I, I kind of feel like it's a safe place to explore some of our fears. You know, um, Wes Craven said that people don't just go to the theater to get scared. It's a cathartic experience, you know, and uh, and I, I love that, that horror is able to take us places. What about you, Anna? My advice would be for the, the music folk, um, which is that when you write a musical, you have the choice to have the music and the words doing the same thing or different things. And sometimes you can create more suspense and tension by having them do different things. So mm. think about how you can actually make your music rub against what's happening in the script. That's really, that's really helpful. And I'm, I'm just throwing it out there. I'm currently seeking a composer for this project. <laughs> wink, wink. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other horror films you would love to see adapted into musicals? Oh gosh, um, there's one that I've just been thinking a lot about. It's a kind of obscure John Carpenter horror film called Prince of Darkness. Oh my God, yes. That I think would kind of be kind of cool. That is the John Carpenter that everyone forgets about. It's so- if I just watched it like six months ago. Okay. I just was obsessed. Like yeah. I just, this movie is like one of those movies that you, that I would have loved to have seen on like a Saturday afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> when I was growing up, it just has like, it just has something to it that I think is really great. It And it has John Carpenter's stamp and yet it feels um, kind of different from the rest of his films. You know, it's yeah. it's such a unique experience. And also um, who also, oh, another one is In the Mouth of Madness, yep. which I also went crazy for. And that woman, Nicole, the first woman who gets like bitten. Okay. Yeah. She like her, like when she's like possessed by the devil or whatever, mm -hmm. like, it's she it's just it's great. It's yeah. so great. What about you, Anna? So this is this is not a very direct answer to your question, but um there is this horror opera called The Turn of the Screw by Benjamin Britten. I've seen it. My friend played one of the children. <laughs> yeah, I think that, that 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 is worthy of a contemporary adaptation. Absolutely. It's a, it's one of the classic ghost stories out there. I mean, Flanagan just did um, Haunting of Bly Manor and changed the story up, but I would love a, like a, a return to the actual story and, and set music to it. Cause that opera is so haunting, you know? It is, it really is. But I also, I also love, um, I love it when like um, the libretti of old operas get updated. Like mm. I think that's, a cool thing too i i mean like the the og horror film that i saw that made me like so terrified of the genre overall was it um yeah. i i you know like i still when i think about it i still like feel the trauma i experienced as a kid in the whenever it was when was it like late 80s or early 90s I think like, it was 90 definitely... i think it was 92 maybe it really like did a number on me so i don't know if i want to see like a singing clown though <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not, but you know, it's interesting to bring that up because my one of my absolutely favorite musicals is another Stephen King adaptation. Carrie is such, yeah. and, you know, I do. I prefer the 1986 version. I think that it has its problems and it's goofy at times, but like having that full orchestra and having, you know, um, taking itself so seriously, 
<laughs> totally works for me. I did love the the more recent um, off Broadway at uh, kind of reconstruction of it as well. Mm. I didn't think of an answer for myself for this question. You know what? <laughs> Actually, if we're gonna stick with Stephen King, and this would have to be like a six hour experience, like Angels in America, um, the stand. Stand. Yeah, you knew what I was gonna. Yeah, I would and love to see that. Be, the stand would be good. I think that would be a good opera. Mm. Yes, thousand percent. It the the characters are so rich and just this you know battle between good and evil, God and the devil is such a classic you know storyline. Holy cow! Although if it were, although maybe it should be a musical so that you can get baby, can you dig your man? <laughs> um, <laughs> You're right. His hit single. You're totally right. <laughs> oh my God. Like Man. every time before COVID, whenever there would be like a thing in the news mm -hmm. about mysterious illness, like or mysterious flu or bug or swine flu or whatever. I would always go, baby, can you take you on there? Captain Trips. Right? That's the name of it in the in the book, right? Is a Captain. Yeah, it's yeah. it's scary. That opening scene. I love the mini, the original mini series. Yeah, the original mini series was, was like seminal. Oh, it's huge in my home. Like even, we, though it's not, even though if you watch it now, it's like very dated in so many ways mm -hmm. and like some really poor filmmaking, but it's still like Corin Nimick as um, Harold Lauder and like um, Laura San Giacomo as the hybrid character. I adore her. Nadine and yeah. uh, one of them he meets in the beginning. Because I've read that novel like four times in my life since I was in seventh grade. Yeah. Yeah. Because I was it, a huge Stephen King kid. Like that was like my guy. Same. And I was reading them too young. And so now in my adult life, I'm rereading a lot of his work. And it's it's scary in a different way. When I was young, I was afraid of monsters and situations. Now I'm afraid of the humans. <laughs> I'm afraid of, you know, the, he was, the always so, he was always so good at that. Of yeah. like taking like what was horrific about humanity, mm -hmm. like little things, like when he made all those people in that town, yeah, like turn against each other. Mm -hmm. That was a peak, like kind of classic. But that was like Shirley the Shirley Jackson the lottery kind of stuff. Very much so. Yeah, yeah. Ooh, ooh, ooh. The haunting as an opera. Let's do it. The original, like based on the novel Haunting of Hill House. Let's do that. All right. Oh. <laughs> Uh, I think we've got some great ideas going. Well, I am so grateful to you for taking the time to be on this podcast. You, you don't know what it means to me. I really do admire both of your work. Where can my listeners stalk you? Um, I'm on Instagram at the living Michael Jackson and Twitter at the living MJ. And I am on Instagram at the Anna K Jacobs and I don't really tweet. So don't look for me there. <laughs> <laughs> and a reminder, listeners, tickets are available now. And I cannot wait to check this show out at least twice. I am already a fan and I haven't even seen it yet. So thank you both so much for taking the time to be on the show. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so the team at Playwrights Horizons has been absolutely terrific to work with and have kindly made arrangements for me to have my next wonderful guest on the show. Mitchell Lichtenstein is an actor, writer, director, and producer. His acting credits include appearances on Cheers and Miami Vice, The Equalizer, and the classic film Flawless, just to name a few. As a writer and director, he's brought us such films as Angelica, Happy Tears, and Resurrection. And today he's here to discuss his impactful, classic dark comedy horror film teeth which he wrote and directed welcome to the pod mitchell lichtenstein thank you so much ricky happy to be here i am so so excited to have you on this show teeth is a lasting film you know you, you this was released in 2007 when when you made this film what what did you think the reaction might be what did you expect people to take from it well i thought it could there was the risk of it being roundly condemned because of its subject matter and it could you know it could be seen as totally misogynist because the myth that i'm sort of working with is clearly misogynist <laughs> so mm. but my intention was to sort of turn that that age-old myth on its head so that uh rather than the woman with uh vagina dentata being being the one that must be conquered by the hero, that she is really the hero 
of the piece. Uh, and and I thought by making this myth, you know, literal and and overt that it takes the power away from it in a way that when it's sort of referenced metaphorically, which it previously had pretty much only been, met, uh, you know, a sort of a metaphor mm. that it, I sort of, I think it does get under the skin in a different way that, that does perpetuate misogyny. So uh, I was hoping that this would sort of do that. And, but yeah, I really had no idea how, really how it would be received. I mean, I had, you know, you know years ago when I was writing this, I had a manager and I showed him the script and he, his response was, don't, show this to anyone anyone who <laughs> reads this will not want to read anything else you ever write goodbye and i never heard from him again oh no so, <laughs> so um so then i was on my own to do it which i'm actually grateful that i did because me and um and my producer joyce tripoline were able to kind of do it you know within a very restricted budget the way that we wanted to do it so. mm, that you know you bring up kind of people's perception and i think people go into this film either not knowing what to expect or they have preconceived notions about the movie that they're about to watch. And so when it turns out to flip misogyny on its head and showcase this female, you know, Anna has used the phrase superheroine to describe Dawn, which I think is really brilliant because, you know, this complicated piece of her body is, you know, a bit of a superpower in, in some ways if you kind of analyze it like that. When did you first come up with the idea for Teeth? Well, first, just to reference, I mean, that's actually how I always saw it too, as a superpower. Amazing. And uh, and the 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 um, structure of the film is basically like all super superhero films that pretty much follow the same pattern, which is you know first the the person doesn't know they have any special power, then it appears this power, they become aware of it, and they reject it. Mm then gradually they accept that it's part of them and ultimately they embrace it and use it for either good or evil, depending on the type of movie it is. And this follows that same pattern. It's the same pattern basically um, as uh, Carrie, which is one of my favorite horror movies. Sure. Um, so, um, but I first, well, I first heard about the the Gina Dentata myth in college, uh, in Bennington College. Mm -hmm. uh, and my teacher there was Camille Paglia who uh, this came up a lot in studying in a late 19th century literature class, because in that sort of so-called decadent literature, this metaphor comes up a lot. And it always stuck with me as, you know, such a strange thing that presumably men would attribute to women and why this is so. And it just stuck with me. And then it's sort of then, you know, I got the idea of, of using it, but turning it on, on its head for a story like this. And then, you know, as I sort of, let acting go and got back to writing, which is what I, as a sort of kid and a teenager, what I always did, um, I start, began working on on this, so. Amazing, what, all right. I have to know, what was your elevator pitch for this film? Uh, well, as I say, it never got me very far because, <laughs> because sure. uh, uh, people were scared of the idea, right. which is sort of a rational fear. No, <laughs> 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 and this had not been done. So um, I think it was something, you know, something I won't be able to to recall what succinctly I said, but it would be about a girl who discovers that she has this super this superpower, and in which she can, in which rather than um, living in fear, she's able to live in her power with this this fear. So excellent. Is there a moment in the film that you're most proud of? I'm right now I'm not thinking of a moment, but but I'm so I'm really so proud of the performances from this young cast. Yeah. Uh, um I'm especially Jess Weixler, who carries really carries and without her real um both very soulful but also comedic performance. I don't think she really understood. Well, I think they all really understood the tone I was going for, and it's a pretty unusual tone. Mm. Uh, so I think it's the it's those moments with the cast that are either unexpectedly touching and within the craziness of the plot, uh, or unexpectedly funny given the gruesomeness of of moments too. So yeah, 
It is a, quite a young cast to capture the tone of this film. Let's talk a little bit about the tone because you accomplished something really remarkable going from these comedic beats to very seriously taken horrific moments of violence and abuse. And it, it shakes the audience and yet every moment is earned, right? Even if something horrible happens and it's followed up by a laugh, it's earned. What was your approach to finding the balance between horror and comedy? I think it just stems from, I mean, it sort of reflects my general <laughs> outlook on, on things and it's sort of a reflection of that, that, you know, for most things, you can't get too serious <laughs> mm. without acknowledging the either the ridiculousness of the war of, of the of the worry of seriousness or whatever. I mean, there are, of course, exceptions where <laughs> things really are serious. But um, the the score really helps. Robert Miller's score yes really helps with that. So either her the super melodramatic that's sort of over the top from you know just the opening opening music. Uh, score, which is the sort of tribal drums uh, that Im that's impending, you know, sort of impending doom. And some of those instances are taken from, because this is all stemming from an ancient myth, so they're sort of, sort of ancient instruments of drums and a sort of woodwind, very primitive wind, woodwind instrument that he used in that. So he contributed a lot to the tone, I'd say. That's the the score in this film adds so much to it. It's just it's excellent. It really it's just a great element of the film. So, all right, you mentioned Carrie as being one of your favorite horror films. What is your relationship to the horror genre in general? Um, I'd say I mostly get a kick out of kind of the old like you might well you you can't the, your audience won't see it, but I have some old framed posters from sixties and fifties sort of horror movies behind me. I noticed. And, uh, I love them. I, <laughs> and um, so I like the sort of camp aspect of those and the, and the, you know, very lame special effects. And, uh, and then I love the, you know, psycho and um, um, I guess of recent ones get out sticks out as a one that, sure. that, that I thought was really effective. Uh, I'm not really a fan of slasher films. You know, I'm also, as many people are, you know, aware in a lot of films of it's of always ending up with a, you know, a nubile woman running around in her underwear wet and scared and that this flying of his sounds sort of offensive, which is why in this, I was in teeth, I was quite careful to never sort of, because it's, you know, the subject is about exploiting women and I was very careful and constant discussion with Jess about, uh, in her role about, you know, never, you know, never having, there's only one moment where she's partially nude and that's in the sort of most, I, you know, I told Wolfgang Held, our VP, uh, you know, this has to be the best glamour shot that you've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And it just has to be a beautiful shot that isn't about, and it's just the moment when she has for the first time experienced a satisfying sexual experience. Uh, the next morning, but I was otherwise careful not to shoot the sort of, you know, exploitive moments that are, you know, so rampant in the genre. So. Sure. I think that's really insightful. And that moment when Don looks at herself in the mirror, I mean, it reads as though like she's seeing herself as a woman for the first time. And she's, you know, yeah. it's just, it's really, it's a great moment and, and it's earned. Yeah, You talk about kind of the gender roles in horror. I just read the book, Men, Women and Chainsaws by Carol J. Clover. Uh, and it's where we get the phrase final girl. It was published in 1991. She coined this phrase and it's a fascinating read about, you know, where women lie within the genre and, and through being seen through the, ma the male gaze, basically. Yeah, that was definitely influential in my research for putting this together, so, yeah. Terrific. It, I mean, you know, she, she talks about how by default, most films are just through the male gaze. And I really find it really terrific that teeth doesn't really land there. And, and I think that's part of what makes it such an impactful movie and kind of shakes you up. You're just not expecting that to happen. Let's talk a little bit about Teeth the Musical. Michael and Anna first came up with this, I believe around 2012. Yeah, something like that, it's been a while. Yeah. And so this was even before Michael had won a Tony or the Pulitzer. So these two, these two talented young people approach you about this idea to turn Teeth into a musical. What was your reaction to that? It, I thought 
you know, at first I thought, oh, it's great. I mean, I had no idea who they were. As you say, they, you know, they didn't really have a high profile at the time. And um, frankly, they were the only ones interested in doing it. So I said, yeah, great. Here's, yeah. you know, uh, an option. And, and at a kind of, you know, low, I thought, you know, cost to do that. And they were working on it for years. And then, I mean, at first it was just, they're the only ones interested, but then they would have uh, presentations of it periodically as they worked on it. And, you know, I mean, they saw their talent and, and the ways they took it away from, from the movie, which were great. So that, you know, first it was just, they're the only ones interested, interested. And then it was just, I really want them to be the ones to do it. So. You, I, I believe you attended some of these workshops and, and presentations, correct? Yes, I did. How does it feel to have something that you have written yourself and worked so hard on taken into the hands of other people and translated to a new medium? Uh, I was apprehensive at first because, you know, I love our movie. <laughs> so, right. But when their take is kind of so different, even though they're, it overlaps a lot. I mean, I'm speaking about just what I saw. I saw several several presentations of it over the years and they changed a lot in each one as they as they rethought and developed and so I don't have no idea where it is now I won't see it till next week right but based on what I've seen I just love I mean some some directions in some parts that they took it wasn't my taste but it's their thing so I think when you know as we talked about it in those years I would say if it wasn't my taste but I I, I didn't had no and didn't want any control really over what what they actually did with it mm. but some were so different from what it's much more in your face which i love there's a certain kind of demureness to the movie despite all, <laughs> all of that which kind of reflects my um i'm actually kind of a prude so okay <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so and that from what i've seen is not at all there and i think it works just it works so well for what they're doing. So I'm so excited to see this adaptation from speaking with them. They, I'm excited to see how excited they are about it as well. Mm -hmm. All right. We'll talk a little bit about you being quote a prude. The film, what I, I love that there are no vaginas shown in this film, except for a, you know, a diagram, but there are penises everywhere. What, what was, uh, what was behind the choice of, of taking that route? Well, I didn't see a way of showing certainly Dawn's teeth without yeah. her becoming a monster, without her seeming to be a monster. And I, she is not the monster. The men are the monster. So, uh, so I I knew right away that for me, there wasn't a way to show that they didn't turn her monstrous as in all of the myths the woman is. But... I had no problem turning the men into, <laughs> into. I mean, you'll also see that there she never, despite all of all of the gore, uh, she's never has a drop of blood on her. She, you know, she remains pure because, she, you know, not sexually, but she is pure of heart and pure of intention. So yeah. Uh, so currently, there's this surge of queer horror filmmakers going on, and they're telling their own stories. And I find this to be really, really exciting. Uh, have you noticed this movement that's going on? And how is it something like, how do you feel about it? I have to tell you, I'm not all that tuned in. So, mm. <laughs> so no, I, I mean, I listened to your last podcast, which is, I think it was the last one. So we were with a filmmaker who had done a, a short, a, you know, clearly gay centered horror short. Mm. So Thanks for listening to the podcast, by the way. Oh, yeah. Well, I didn't know what I was in for. Right. Yeah. Got to do your <laughs> research. Oh, all right. You mentioned Carrie. What are some of your other favorite horror films? Oh, wow. Uh, well, I had mentioned Psycho, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Get Out. Um, I don't know. Help me. What are some, what are some of yours? Oh, goodness. Uh, Halloween, The Haunting, the 1963 Robert Weiss version, not the remake. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm a big Vincent Price fan. The, and even the, I think the 70s are my biggest influence for horror. It was such a pioneering time in Hollywood, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, kind of the guerrilla Suspiria. filmmaking. I, so I just saw Suspiria at the IFC Center here in New York. They did a whole Argento retrospective. And uh. so um, my friend Sarah Lyons is a witch, and they had a post show discussion about witchcraft and its representation in film. And um, man, to see that film on a screen have you have you experienced on a movie screen maybe the first time i saw it was might have been on but that was so long ago uh but i yeah i saw it you know just 
I don't know, 10 years ago, more recently. So yeah, yeah. got it. No, it's great. It's beautiful. Jessica Harper was recently at the restaurant that I work at and I, I remained professional and I didn't freak out and I didn't go tell her what a fan I was, but oh man, was it cool to see her. Uh, <laughs> she, uh, yeah, she was, I mean, just, I, she, her body of work, I just love, you know, such a beautiful voice, Phantom of the Paradise and oh, um, yeah. yeah, but uh, yeah. would you, would you ever make another horror film? Um, maybe I'd have to have a, I just, you know, have to have a good idea. Um, I mean, my last film, Angelica, isn't a horror, but it's gothic, I would say. It mm. is. Uh, so there are, you know, possible spirits and um, uh, it it's 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 sort of a psychological horror, uh, suspense, horror, gothic thing. It's based on a novel by Arthur Phillips. He's a present day writer, but it takes place in the Victorian era. All right, let's talk about that for a moment. Working on a period film, what are some of the challenges of approaching that time period? I wouldn't I wouldn't call any of it challenges. Uh, right. Maybe it's challenges for the actors who have to wear corsets and, and, oh God. and you know, and there's just a lot of clothing and stuff. I was really ha happy to work with my old friend and costume designer, Rita Ryak, who she did the costumes for um, Teeth and also for Angelica. And she had never worked in this period, I think in 19th century at all. So it was, I was actually so eager to give her, because she's a brilliant costume designer and uh, to give her this opportunity and challenge to to do this. And her, I mean, her costumes are amazing. And I mean, in directing wise, it's, it's sort of the same thing. The challenges are for, you know, the actors who have to, there's a different sort of in behavior for the, DP to create this period and it's the great cinematographer Dick Pope did that and so he's he's done that a lot and is you know can do anything basically so I would almost say the challenges are for other people <laughs> than for the director really so great well you I mean you clearly have such a talent and vision it's it's great to be able to go in and and work with such an incredible team those costumes yeah. and teeth are really clever uh, I, I mean, but I love the moment when Dawn walks into Brad's bedroom and it's just black and hardcore and metal and she's just wearing this unicorn shirt. Yeah. She's so out of place in there. <laughs> that was all Rita and we have laughed about that so much because it's so perfect. It's <laughs> yeah. so perfect. Yeah. She's so uncomfortable in there. I mean, the the layered clothing, it's so 2007. I really, really love it. I, I loved noticing the placement of her purity ring and the use of it throughout the film. Um, and when and how it shows up, how, I mean, those are clearly intentional decisions. Where did those decisions come from? Oh, uh, that specifically, I don't really remember exactly how we kind of decided to use those. Uh, but all of that about the, the whole purity thing, that's all taken from, you know, research. Uh, I mean, all of that basically is true. Anything to do with, with sort of what there's the way they talk, uh, the way the, pastor the whatever whatever he is is his you know even in the the health class the thing with the diagram and hiding hiding the female genitalia behind a sticker that was all done in texas i believe oh my god uh, at the time so all of that was from it was you know it was written and came out during the whole bush abstinence period so that was they were really pushing that sure. at that time there's a it was a serious thing. It is alarming that so much of the commentary that this film makes has not progressed as much as one might hope by now, you know? Yeah, yeah it, it seemed to relevant. have progressed since, and then it just, it, it, it's so, yeah, growing up, I didn't think things would be cyclical. I thought, I thought, you know, it, it all progresses in a slow but definite arc. <laughs> yeah. But uh, unfortunately, no. Yeah. I, I grew up in a very conservative church and was actually in a musical about abstinence. So ah. <laughs> Don, I, I, I appreciate Don written as a non-judgmental and well-meaning Christian who's quite misinformed. I think that she, you know, there's never a moment when you're like, oh my God, this woman, like you really, you know, you're on her side. And I think that she she's such a real and well-fleshed out character. And I think that lies with you and the performer as well. It's just, God, what, a, what where did you find Jess to cast her as Dawn? Well, our casting director, Carrie Barton, uh, he's great. We had a hard time casting this because uh, when he sent it out to agents, 
some of the agencies, the big agencies would not show anyone because they thought it was because of the subject matter. They thought it was pornography, whatever. So we were immediately limited, but Carrie from the beginning thought of Jess for that part. And, but she wouldn't come in because she was for good reason, afraid of the, of the part. And then eventually we got her to come in to read for a different part. And she did that. And then when she was there, we convinced her to read for, for Dawn. And she did, but she was still not, you know, we had to win her over. And basically I just, you know, we went to my house with, you know, others of the, you know, the, with Carrie and Joyce, the producer. And I just, she got to know us enough to know that this wasn't going to be pornographic or exploitive. And she signed on, which was great because as you say, she adds, she, she's the soul of the movie really. So. She is. And it, I mean, she appears to approach this role fearlessly as well. She's so committed. And I mean, the whole cast is the movie is committed to itself. And that's something to really appreciate. It's a confident film who, that knows what it's doing and what it's saying. All right, this is a selfish question for myself. I'm writing my very first screenplay and it is a horror film mm -hmm. and it deals with very bizarre, unusual subject matter. So do you have any advice for a first time screenwriter who's also writing a very unusual, seldom explored story? I would just say just based on my experience with teeth is to go for it because I had no help really getting it done except from my friends who, you know, uh, and would you know, as I said earlier, pointedly told to burn it, basically. <laughs> uh, so glad you didn't, by the way. <laughs> uh, so, you know, if you're committed to your idea, you know, try not to worry about what, if it hasn't been done before, if it's too, you know, it, it does make it harder to get produced, but then find a way to, you know, to do it for basically no money or whatever you need to do. But yeah, I guess you you know you can't really count on getting help from anyone on the, sure. in business. Uh, you know, you'd have to have made someone a lot of money already to get <laughs> to get that help. And I've unfortunately never made anyone a lot of money. So <laughs> that's the way of the artist. I mm -hmm. I will not. I, it, Teeth came out at a time that I was really discovering independent cinema. And it has become such an important part of me. I, I, I love independent films. I love film festivals. I, I I just think that it they to be able to experience storytelling in a way that is so not mainstream Hollywood and you know to experience mm -hmm. real stories is just independent cinema is such an incredible medium. This film, am I correct? Premiered at Sundance. Is that correct? It did. Yeah. And, and to to very good response. Uh, it was yes. well received. What was that like? It was because we had we really hadn't seen it with an audience. And the first screening was it was packed and it was like a, being on a roller coaster because, I mean, people, the reactions were very loud and visceral and with, you know, gaffes or laughs or whatever. And it was really, you could tell people were following it. And I was pulled out of the screening halfway through because some, you know, company wanted to buy the film. So it was sort of in the middle of that, that, of that first screening. Before they had even finished the film. Yeah. Oh my God. Just, I think, presumably just from the reaction that it was getting. Yeah. So. That's wild. Congratulations. It didn't turn out to be so great, but yeah, that was, it started out, that was exciting, but as, as many filmmakers have gone through that, you know, what, a company says they're going to do to help you out. Mm. They don't necessarily do so. Damn. And you really have no recourse. So, yeah. But so the, it didn't get the release that we were promised. But looking back, I kind of am happy because I, f it, was, it, was, it was released kind of briefly, not for not for very long mm -hmm. uh, not, and not as widely as um, promised. But um, really, I think it, because it had made such a stir in just in that, that it, I think people had to seek it out and people discovered it on their own and it wasn't pushed down their throats with millions of dollars in advertising. Mm -hmm. So I think people have almost a deeper connection to it because they really, they did have to find it, find it themselves. I, you know, I know when, when physical copies really still the thing, they were passed around sort of secretly between, you know, to, teenagers and stuff. And I think that is a great way to discover this movie. So 
So. I, it very much a word of mouth film. I am I correct? It, I think it was one of like the when Netflix was a big a big thing starting out. I believe it was on Netflix as kind of the, one of the pioneering uh, uh, films to discover on the on the on the streaming service. If I'm not mistaken, uh, you might be right. I don't really know. I'm thinking more before that one. There were just um, you know DVDs that you could. Uh, uh, or see DVDs that you could pass around, but yeah. Sure. Well, and now there's such a push for physical media. Again, people are very into buying Blu-rays because streaming services can just take it away. Like you can buy something on Amazon Prime and it, you own it, quote, and they'll just, they have the right to take it away from you. Oh, I didn't realize they could uh, yeah. take it away. If you had it's a big it. push for physical media these days, which I think is uh, terrific because it, I, if I understand correctly, it pays the artists more. Like they get more of the... Um, I don't know how it works. <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah. All right. Well, I have one more question for you. I like to ask this of all of my professionals uh, okay. because I'm, you know, a horror podcast. What scares you? Um, chaos. Mm. I would say. Um, I'm. I don't think I actually have OCD, but I'm a little bit like you know. I have to know a bit of the lay of the land <laughs> I'm getting into to be at all comfortable. Like I had to listen to your podcast to know, get a feeling of what that's, you know, a tiny example of that. Sure. Uh, so that's, a, that's generally a fear of mine. Um, I've somewhat overcome my fear of spiders. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> Living in the country, you have to kind of basically overcome that. So. They're, they're going to be there. I've embraced that there are spiders somewhere living in my New York apartment. And as long as they don't show themselves, I <laughs> we're fine. We're good. We're good. Mitchell, I can't thank you enough for taking the time. I This film has such a legacy. And I, I just hope that you realize that. It's a film that is still talked about. It's still respected. And it's still passed around from friend to friend. And, and um, <laughs> you made you made a hell of a movie that, that people oh, really do love. Thank you, Ricky. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. And... Uh, yeah, you're going to see this all put together with, yeah, with uh, your other commentators. I am. Yeah, it's going to be a terrific episode, and I can't wait to see the musical. I'm going to be their opening night. Um, I know you're seeing uh, it before then, so uh, I'm excited yeah. for you to experience it. Yeah, but I'll probably be their opening night, so I'll look for you. So. Great. Great. I'll be sure to say hi. Yeah. Uh, Mitchell, right. thank you so much, and enjoy the rest of your day. Happy Valentine's Day. Yeah, happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> this is a perfect, you know, I always said that Teeth was a great date movie. Just last date movie. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Actually, on that, I actually love in the credits, I believe it says no men were harmed in the making of this. Yeah. Movie. <laughs> I, I, I thought that was fun. It's brilliant. Yeah. All right. Mitchell, have a gorgeous yeah. day. And thank you again. Bye. Bye bye. I've invited a very dear friend to help me discuss the plot of Teeth. Evelyn is an advocate for gender and sex worker rights, an artist, and a burlesque performer. She's also the designer of the podcast's gorgeous website, rickretreat.com. Welcome to the show, Evelyn DeVere. Hi. Hey. Glad to be here. Oh, man, I'm so happy to have you. I always relish the time that we ever get to spend together. I'm, I'm so yeah. grateful for you taking the time to do this. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm glad to to finally be on the show. We've talked about it for a little bit. We have. Evelyn and I met a number of years ago in Charleston. When I was living down in Charleston, Evelyn uh, was heavily involved. I mean, frankly, in my opinion, running the burlesque scene down south. <laughs> Let's not go like too crazy. Okay. Maybe, All right. Maybe in Charleston for a period of time. <laughs> you know what? Fine. I, In my eyes, you were running my burlesque life. And, you know, I did burlesque for a while down there. And, and Evelyn was so... Uh, helpful in encouraging me and, and getting me started and she's spooky and goth and talented and driven and powerful and gorgeous just like me so we hit it off <laughs> <laughs> you were the first person that i thought of for this film because yeah. it's so unlike any other movie that's out there and it is so heavily embedded within discussing the female body and the female anatomy. And these are taboo topics that don't often get talked about. What, Evelyn, is your relationship to the movie Teeth? So I I must have seen it shortly after it came out, uh, maybe a year or two after, because I know I saw it either in college or right after that. 
and uh and then I actually didn't watch it again until last year so and then I just watched it today great one thing is like I'm like oh oh seven I'm like mm, this is oh seven yeah <laughs> <laughs> like I was like yes girl you are wearing the puffed cap sleeve short sleeve shirt over the long sleeve shirt like I was like it was very like b- like nostalgic but in that way that you're like Wow, we dressed like that. <laughs> so many layers, so many layers. <laughs> but yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, so that's that's my uh, my history. <laughs> yeah, you know, same here. I saw the film when it came out, and there was so much buzz about it. And I, 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 you see the poster for this film, and you instantly know what it's about. And I actually really love that about it. It's so cheeky. And yeah. I think for me, the experience of watching it for the first time was that it was nothing like what I expected it to be. And um, and I love that because it's a lesson for myself in expectations about movies, about women, you know? What did you expect? I expected a monstery vagina just eating guys, you know? <laughs> but what I love about this movie is that it, it shows so many dicks and no <laughs> vaginas. <laughs> Except for the textbook, that's it. Except for the textbook, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's it's brilliant and I just think it's a really interesting film I revisiting it now post me too is really fascinating to me because if I'm just speaking from my own experience I have learned a lot I've become enlightened a lot and I've learned how to listen to other people and mm-hmm. I you know it, it's just I, I view the film in a different way than I did back in 2007 2008 yeah yeah um I I loved watching it on this on the most my most latest viewing today um I mean and every other time but yeah I just I feel like I, I yeah I see a few more layers each time and um I I forgot how really funny mm-hmm. it was also yeah. and I really you know, yeah, I, I like that element of it a lot, particularly in, you know, I mean, not that I, I don't know how much things have materially changed um, mm. since Me Too. I, you know, that could be another discussion, but I, uh, I like the element of humor because so often it's like, that is how we get through these like traumas and violations and just like, living our our lives every day in the Mm -hmm. outside you have to you have to have that or else you know (laughs) it it can get a little rough you know so uh I like that there was that kind of true to true to life you know in this somewhat fantastical but also very real film yeah the the humor punctuates these moments of really severe um and upsetting material you know, it's funny until it's not. And then it's not funny until it is. And I actually think it's a really clever balance that this film um, achieves in in its pacing and its tone. And I, I do think that it's something that catches people off guard. And I'll be honest, I don't know that everybody who watches this movie gets that. But mm. it's very much there. And I every time I've seen this film, I appreciate that aspect of it more and more. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I could see how people, you know, skip over the humor just because like the the gore moments are so visceral i had forgotten <laughs> i had forgotten how gross this movie is <laughs> i know you're like you ooh, all right i feel like we should just start going through it because i i feel like i'm gonna start like you're right you're right you're right let's do it let's do it we're gonna talk about the plot of t 2007 written and directed by Mitchell Lichtenstein who we've just met Uh, music is by Robert Miller and I actually really want to talk about the score to this film because I think that it adds so much to what's happening between kind of like the horror movie violin moments or you know comedic beats or kind of like 50s housewife sounding music it's just yes 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 it's excellent but it's purity music purity music i actually really love uh there's a moment when dawn is sitting on her bed listening to this christian pop song of something about like it's it's waiting waiting yeah it's <laughs> worth it to wait love is worth waiting for i think that's it and then we have some really gorgeous and clever cinematography by wolfgang held as well just uh, some notable credit this movie was filmed in and around austin texas and i uh, 
read that there were protests in the neighborhood that this film was being filmed in because they were under the impression that they were making a porn. <gasps> wow, that is so apt. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. It's cool. very Texas and it's very anti, <laughs> anti-female anti anatomy, anti- Wow, that's really poetic mm -hmm. in a way. All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, let's dive into this. We open on a small town in what I believe is Ohio. Uh, at the center of the town are these two giant nuclear cooling towers, and they're emitting smoke. And throughout the course of this film, the smoke that comes out of them, they show up um, frequently throughout the film. The smoke becomes darker and more billowy as the mm -hmm. film goes on. Now, Dawn and Brad are two very young step siblings. Dawn is practically a baby, and they're sitting in an inflatable pool in the front yard of their suburban house, while Brad's dad, Bill, and Beth's mom, Kim, sit in the lawn chairs and watch while they're relaxing. So uh, Bill and Kim are, are married to one another. Brad, we instantly find out, is a misbehaving monstrous brat because he mouths off and curses at his father. And then he turns to Dawn and he pulls down his swim trunks to reveal himself to her. And he tells her to show him hers. It's kind of a moment where like kids do this, right? It's something that happens. And yet between step siblings, between siblings, between this age difference, it's, it's we're instantly uncomfortable around Brad. <laughs> yes he's never not uncomfortable never never not uncomfortable off <laughs> off camera we hear brad shout out in pain when his dad goes to check we see that the tip of his index finger has a terrible bite mark it's practically like almost bitten off and he's dripping blood and don just looks at it and she's asked by her mother if she's okay we fade to black and we get our title card teeth i love the opening credits to this film because we get these like microscopic organisms swimming around slowly being devoured by these like predatorial microorganisms but one of them looks different than the rest it's kind of actually i just realized it's kind of billowy almost like those clouds or the smoke coming from the nuclear towers it's got like yeah. kind of a, a black smoky look to it i don't know if that's purposeful but uh, <laughs> so uh it's kind of a mutation and that one actually devours the two predators that are chasing after it. And then as soon as it does, we get uh, the words directed by Mitchell Lichtenstein <laughs> on the screen. <laughs> we fade back to Dawn uh, as a teenager now, played by Beth Weixler. And she's giving a peer lecture about the importance of abstinence and saving oneself to fellow students at her school at a meeting called The Promise Keepers. So I'm just going to throw this out there. I grew up in a very conservative Christian home and went to a very, like kind of the power churches with the faith healing and the speaking in tongues and dancing in the aisles. And I, we did a musical called True Love Waits. Mm, yes. Tell me everything. <laughs> about abstinence. And I played a mean boy who wrote something nasty about my fellow student on a wall. And then she sang a very sad song about it. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, we, we had a song about uh there was a song called there was a song called Every Date is a Mystery Date. Uh, and it was it was literally a song about date rape in a church musical. Cool. Wait, but probably not the message that we like wish it was, right? No, no, not from a not <laughs> not from a perspective that is pro any sort of intimacy, but in a well, if you don't want to get raped, just don't have any sex. Yeah, sure. Or yeah. be on a date. Or be on a date. Great. <laughs> so that's the that's the life that I'm coming from. So the religious trauma aspect of this film, I actually think I, I love and I really appreciate because there was a point in my life when I was very much like Don. <laughs> well, yeah, as I, you know, I was thinking about, you know, the whole purity culture, which, you know, it's crazy. This was written, you know, what, 15 years ago. And like, I feel like it's almost only it's it's morphed and gotten bigger <laughs> yeah. like more people people who wouldn't have who wouldn't have been in like you know uh the what do they call it in the it's like the the ring or the the, the they're the promise keepers and then they were the they were red rings on their right. on their wedding yeah. ring fingers you know um and i think you know thinking about what message that is and like it makes a lot of sense that, you know, she has, she has this like, and of course, I mean, we can look, 
we can look at like the teeth in so many different ways, but I think, you know, a pretty common way to look at it would be like women's fear of their own sexuality. Cause of mm -hmm. course we're not really taught anything and it's, it's really, you know, I mean, just as depicted in the film, like it's, it's depicted as like unseeable. This is scary. This is like, we cannot know anything about this. Yeah. And so and also then her, like, she knows something's up because of that experience in the pool. You know, mm -hmm. she also knows something's like a little, like actually scary. Yeah. Um, and so it would make sense as a response from that, that it's like, okay, like, yes, purity club seems perfect. <laughs> like, I don't actually have to deal with any of this. I, it's, it's fine. It is just, we're just scratching that off for now or forever. And, uh, and I think that's, you know, we see that now in a lot of ways as well, because sex has been made even more scary in this intervening time, you know, and, and the, the amount of people being like, I mean, like all the, um, the studies where they're like, people are having less sex than before. And it's like, it, I think yeah and part of it you know people say is like because people are choosing who they want to have sex with and like you know and I think I do think that probably has something to do with it but I think it's also like the messaging that like this is scary this is bad um you know don't do it <laughs> and so it makes sense to me that of course she of course she lands in, in purity club or right. you know what I'm calling it purity club <laughs> <laughs> purity yeah and, and, and <laughs> she's like a leader in this club yeah, yeah she's a speaker she's like going yeah. to the high school circuit yeah exactly yeah. um she um, yeah um she describes the importance of these red rings that they wear i actually i love she says i think uh the way it wraps around your finger is to remind you to keep your gift wrapped <laughs> until you trade it one day for that other ring the gold ring but during her speech she locks eyes with a boy named toby he's played by hale appleman who smiles at her. So even right off the get-go, she's up there preaching abstinence, but you can't turn off noticing <laughs> someone you're attracted to. Afterward, Dawn tells her friends that her mom is sick again, and everyone gets really sad for her, and Toby comes behind and is introduced. He's going to start new at their school. Uh, meets Dawn. They're instantly, you know, shy around each other. The music swells romantically. I love this. Mm -hmm. And Dawn actually hides her promise ring with her other hand, which I think is is really Ooh, interesting. I, the, that. The, I mean, it's bright red. And I love that because it makes it, it I think the direction of where the ring is throughout the film is pretty clever. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Uh, Toby compliments her on her speech and she uh, smiles. Now, after she rides her bike home from school, I love all the bike riding that she does in this movie. <laughs> oh my God, she is on that bike. Yeah, Dawn sits with her mom, who is sick in bed uh, and hanging out with stepdad. Her mom's in a lot of pain. We get the impression through this discussion that Dawn might be a lot more conservative than her mom and stepdad are. But they're okay with it. You know, they love her and she's not hurting anybody except her own <laughs> sexual development. <laughs> right, they're pretty supportive. They're like, right. oh, that wasn't for us, but like, cool, like, good for you. You're doing this thing that's important to you, whatever, you know? Yeah. Their moment is ruined when Brad, the stepbrother, now a probably 20-ish year old adult, blasts this hardcore metal music from his bedroom. And, and he's played by John Hensley, who, did you watch Nip Tuck? No. Okay, so <laughs> mellow, melodramatic soap opera show about plastic surgeons. And uh, mm -hmm. he was on it, playing the complete opposite of this character in the film Teeth. <laughs> yeah when teeth came out i was like my mind was blown that he was not playing okay. the 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 sweet kind of weird kid <laughs> don is sitting on her bed listening to that christian pop song love is worth waiting for at the same time brad is seen in his own room in his underwear smoking a cigarette playing with a, a gun next day don gets to school and she's mocked by her fellow students for her purity and I actually really love the shot when she's kind of walking and they're all like, oh, we got what kind of soda? Cherry soda. We're going to pop it. They're just being total assholes. And her her reaction to it as an actor is just like smile through it and be sweet. Like, I I think she's perfect in this role. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was great. She like takes you through this journey. The arc is very present with her and I, it's perfect casting. Mm -hmm. Now, she and Toby notice each other again in sex ed class. The teacher has just finished describing the penis and then tells the students to turn the page. 
And we see in every single textbook, the diagram of the vagina actually has a giant gold sticker over it. The vulva. The teacher, it's exactly. And the teacher won't say the word vagina. He won't talk about it at all. And we get this interesting moment where Don remarks that it's because women have a natural modesty and it's in their nature and we're built with it, you know? And the other kids snicker, but Toby backs her up and then they smile at each other. I, so that part I, I wrote down because I was like, oh, it's so funny that the one kid's like, well, why don't, you know, why are you showing the vulva picture or whatever? And uh, he's like, you showed the penis picture. And the teacher's like, that's different. And it's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there are I mean this is not so subtle but there are a more subtle shutting down of like any discussion of vagina or the female lived experience at all throughout this film yeah 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 but yeah and then about like oh yeah the the natural modesty thing like I I just to me that also is such a a little succinct thing of how you know there's this book I read called Untrue by Wednesday Martin and it's about how all of the research or conceptions you know like modern period you know like con conceptions of sex and specifically like female sexuality is was basically just all kind of like made up <laughs> mm. I do like yeah uh, you know, and how, like, the studies of how, like, oh, like, well, women, you know, men want to, like, be really sexual and women, you know, don't. And it's, like, it was based on a, a study of fruit flies um, that was never able to be replicated even. <laughs> wait, what? No, wait. <laughs> yes, this is one scientist was just like, look, here's how it's going to be. <laughs> so he studied fruit um, flies and then wrote about female fruit fly behavior well, and related it, it to like, women? Extrapolating. Yeah, 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 totally. Because, like, sure <laughs> um but uh but I wanna anyway say I'm surprised and I'm not that, exactly and thinking about how much of that is like you know kind of like the patriarchy uh <laughs> deciding how they want women's sexuality to be and then making that such an ingrained thing to aspire to or to fail at and then selling it back. So she's like, oh, it's natural modesty. No, I'm sorry. Is it, is it because like the school board, which is like, or like whatever, they, what do they say? Like the, does it say school board or legislature or something like that? It's like probably all like old white men. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's like, is it because they said you couldn't have this knowledge or is it because you're modest? Like right. which one? is it you know but how that how's those like how that oppression is like repackaged and sold back you know as like no no it's just because I'm like really modest and women don't have sexual urges or you know like whatever and it's a great point because she believes it like totally 100%. she's she's the kind of Christian who is not act she's not actively like being judgmental and preachy at people and yet she is very self-sure in what she is saying that mm -hmm. it is a judgment call, you know, it, it, whether That's it's intended or yeah, whether it's intended or not, you know, she firmly believes what she's saying. And so that makes everybody else in the room wrong. Yeah. But she's not, she's not mean about it. You know? Yeah. I never felt like she was necessarily judging or anything like that, you know, but she's she definitely I, I think obviously like from her parents that's probably something because they're not you know they're like okay well you do you like we're cool with it and she treats everyone else that way as well mm -hmm. but just that she was like no I have knowledge to share with the class sure sure <laughs> you know? she was like no no it's just because like women are naturally modest and that's why they're not going to show this because mm -hmm. it's to protect us you know <laughs> uh the education system. All right. So after class, Don, Toby, and a couple of other friends go to a movie, but their options are super limited. One is rated R and the other is PG-13. And Don, I think it is, remarks that the PG-13 film might still have someone making out in it. So <laughs> she said, I wrote it down because I loved Good. it so much. She said, well, even the PG-13 is going to have heavy making out. <laughs> it's like, Ooh, how heavy? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, we see them in the in the theater and we don't see what movie we're watching but we hear and it sounds like a looney tunes episode like it's a cartoon yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she and toby are sharing popcorn and there's you know the 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 meat cute kind of touch of a hand or you know they lock eyes again we all know where this is going 
<laughs> now, Brad is in his room getting stoned with his girlfriend, Melanie. She is played by Nicole Swan. And she asks him about the scar on his fingertip. He says that he was a little kid when it happened and he doesn't remember how, but he's like, I think she did it. Dawn. And she was like, a baby bit you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then he's like, just do more drugs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He like shoves the bong in her face. <laughs> Actually, that's a good point because a bong is phallically shaped. And he does that again with something else in a minute to shut yeah. her up. He's shoving phallic shapes into her mouth. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Mitch All right, Mitchell Lichtenstein. I know it. I see what you're doing here. <laughs> or is it just that he has like horrible boundaries and no like concept of consent? <laughs> I'm going to call it both. Why not both? <laughs> <laughs> so after the movie, Don, Toby, and the other friends drive out to a known makeout spot in the forest to hang out. Only with at night time. Only at nighttime. <laughs> yeah. During the day, it's fine. But and they promise they're going to police each other and they're going to keep each other on track. They come upon a beautiful lake with this waterfall. I want to go here, by the way. Oh, my God. It's gorgeous. <laughs> Is this, this somewhere in Texas? Yeah. Well... All right, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> Behind this waterfall is a cave, and it's a place where people go to, you, you know. know. <laughs> <laughs> so now we cut back to Brad and his girlfriend, and they've just finished having anal sex, and she remarks on the fact that they never have vaginal sex. I think she says something like, about a, I've got a perfectly good pussy, and he completely disregards it and lights a cigarette and beckons his Rottweiler. So he has this, like, aversion to the vagina, right? He's only having anal sex with his girlfriend. Uh, the Rottweiler's name is Mother, which is so shitty. Oh my God. <laughs> he weirdly shoves a bone-shaped dog treat like all over his girlfriend's mouth and eventually like gets it into her mouth and she bites on it. Um, so again, he's like shutting her up with a phallic-shaped fucking weird thing. He's just shoving in her but face. But it's not it's not with that. Like it wasn't even shutting up. It's like he he called the dog over to give it the biscuit and it snapped at him because it knows. And so he still had the biscuit in his hand. And she was like, you know, she said something of like the dog, like, you know, basically like, yeah, the dog knows. <laughs> right. That's and then he's like just like forcing it in. He's like kind of like playing with her lips with it. And then yeah. like, Ew, it's, man, that scene, I was like, oh. Well, and he throws, <laughs> throughout the movie, he throws the word bitch around so much. Like, a female dog is a bitch, so if this bitch won't eat the cookie, then this bitch will. Like, that's, yeah, yeah. I feel like I'm, that's where he's coming from. Yeah, he calls his mom a bitch at some point. Um, back at the lake, Dawn and Toby discuss her desire to wait until marriage. And he asks if anyone has ever touched her. And she mm -hmm. says, absolutely not. And he says, well, you know, I too am a virgin in his eyes and then there's a dramatic <laughs> shift in the music and this is when i said that when i said that there's a judgment call from her this is specifically the moment that i was thinking of because she takes a moment and she's surprised and having grown up in such a christian church she can she changes i perceive it as though it becomes a compassionate moment but it is compassion based on judgment of what he's done in his past oh sure because she's like, well, you know, you're probably just even stronger now because you've, what does she say? It's like, uh, you've been- Your resolution. You know, you're the dangers. <laughs> your resolve. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, you, you know the dangers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. It's that like, you know, you can like pray for forgiveness and be brand new again. Yeah. And I do appreciate her ability to like yeah. come to that conclusion, you know? Oh, sure. Yeah. That night, Dawn puts her mom to bed, who's been in bed watching an old B-movie about a giant scorpion monster. And then when Dawn gets into bed, she starts touching her body. And it's with the hand that's wearing the red promise ring. She's <laughs> touching herself kind of around her thighs as images of her in a wedding dress and Toby in a tuxedo flash on the screen. As she pulls the sheets down over her knees, Toby pulls the veil over her head and she then imagines him shirtless. And mm. su suddenly she's in her own bed wearing a wedding dress as she explores her body. And she's imagining Toby in bed with her in his tuxedo, removing her garter. And just as her hand begins to reach for her vagina, she imagines the giant scorpion monster's toothy face <laughs> charging at the camera. And she, she reacts in shame and she says, what's wrong with me? I 
loved this scene the way it was shot because I feel like it does a perfect job of kind of that in and out like you're you're like if you're laying in bed and having some personal time you know it's like you're you're in your room but maybe you're half in your fantasy you know and it's and with the the way it was shot they blend those things because I was noticing it's like okay well she's fantasizing about their literal wedding day yeah and I was noticing I'm like okay now you see like it's the wedding dress being pulled up not the nightgown you know yep and I was looking for you know her gold ring (laughs) yeah and but then it's still her purity ring (laughs) even in the full fantasy of like the wedding dress and you know the flowers and the champagne and everything i i was like ah, right it's still her fantasy like it's not you know yeah and then it's you know it kind of pulls back and we see him like you know coming on top of her and it's like her room in the background like her little pink layup is there and whatever mm-hmm. And then the next time it flashes back to that, it's like all black and there's red roses and, you know, it's like she's further into the fantasy, you know? Yeah, it's super well edited and well crafted. I also have to applaud the showcasing of female self-stimulation in 2007 Mm -hmm. specifically because, I mean, we still don't see enough of it, but I feel like we, we weren't seeing any of it back then. I mean, it's actually consistently like going down since the 80s. So, I mean, I don't know. (sighs) I hate that. (laughs) <laughs> I don't, but I, I really do. I love that sequence so much. I do think it's a really beautiful sequence. Very well constructed. And then I love the like, what's wrong with me? Because I, it could be two things. It could be, you know, it's like, oh my God, like I have different this different anatomy. What's wrong with me? But then I also just love the aspect of like, your brain is fucked up, you know? And we'll oh, do yeah. like, it'll be like, oh, I'm in this fantasy. And then it's like, B movie tooth monster and it's like what the fuck is wrong with me (laughs) (laughs) you know like I just felt like that's like you know deeper themes aside like that's just a really funny moment because yeah (laughs) yeah it really it is again that blend of of you know the the humor mixed with moments of levity mixed with it's just it's so well executed the next day Dawn arrives late to class which is a bummer because she could have really taken something from this lesson, the teacher is explaining the difference between incipient mutations in rattlesnakes developing over millions of years versus a snake being born with a full rattle attached to its tail, uh, being beneficial to its survival. So it's a discussion about mutation versus evolution versus adaptation. And it's a really clever moment. I think that the fact that this film acknowledges adaptation is very fucking smart because whether her vagina comes from this nuclear power plant or whether these teeth in her vagina are an evolution, the fact that adaptation is something that women have to do to move through the world is terrifying and overlooked. And I I love that this movie highlights that. Yeah. I, I really think of that in like terms of, you know, epigenetics and intergenerational trauma. And it's like, this, this is passed down. It could be trauma that you never experienced. It could be trauma you have piled on top of other stuff. It could, you know, it's like all of that shapes how you act and how you respond and how you behave. And um, yeah, I think, I think it's a really, really interesting way to tackle all of that. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, just like you said, you know, when she's in bed, uh, touching herself, it, that jumping to shame in your head, like it, it, the intergenerational trauma, it all adds up and like leads to need the need for years and years of therapy mm-hmm. <laughs> to unpack yeah. the things that are just embedded into us from the moment that we're born. It's, I mean, sex right. should not be as scary as the world tries to make it. Yeah. Well, and you can even see it's like, it's once we meet her parents and see how they act and stuff, like they're really chill. Mm -hmm. They're not taking her to the mega church, you know? Yeah. Uh, They don't seem really particularly religious or whatever at all. You get the feeling that they were like, kind of like hippies maybe, or like on the fringe of that. Um, But uh, so it's, 
you know, it's from the culture. Mm -hmm. It's from the lack of, you know, and I also think about like her kind of almost the absence of a mother, Mm -hmm. you know, because she's not, she cannot do any caretaking. Mm -hmm. She is, she has to be cared for. And so there's not that like mother daughter talk of your body. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think even in the most liberal and well-meaning parents doesn't happen enough. Yeah, for sure. I mean, God, my discussion with my parents is one of the many reasons that I go to therapy. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I think you you bring up a great point too. It would be so easy to make her parents like Carrie White's parents, like, you know, very like overly oppressively religious. And, oh, that's the reason why. But the fact that she, she, culture has put the, has introduced this to her and the fact that she has like embraced it as well um of on her own is really interesting to me um yeah. whether that's healthy because or not her personal uh experiences with her body mm-hmm. thus far yeah you know the lack uh, of knowledge now so don it's, it's i guess after gym class and we interesting moment because we're so used to seeing locker room scenes where the women are topless and naked and running around. If we're talking about the movie Carrie, right? That's the whole opening sequence. And in this, it's just a boy's locker room and we see asses, we see a dick and these shirtless guys and uh, Toby gets a phone call and it's Beth in her locker room where like, we don't see topless girls running around. (laughs) Also in the dude's locker room, there's like the coach just standing there watching all of the naked miners walking around. I'm like, all right. I didn't notice that. Oh. <laughs> Fortunately, um, not girls, I don't think. Now, on the phone, they both admit that they've had unpure thoughts about one another. I actually love that. I guess they're both unclothed at this moment while they're saying this too. And that it's a bad idea to spend time with, together anymore, even if they're in a big group. That night, Dawn reads about the Gorgon Medusa as Brad and his girlfriend fight in the other room. So the next day, Don knocks on Brad's door and enters. And I, I just love this shot because his walls are painted black and he's got hardcore posters and stickers and shit all over the place. And then she enters in this like white shirt with a unicorn on it. But it's like, <laughs> it's like the kind of sh- like that would come from Walmart. You, you know what? I, can you picture it? Like, like, you know, those shirts with cats on it or puppies. Like it's, hey. it's yeah. that. <laughs> She just looks so out of place here. (laughs) And I guess, of course, unicorns represent like mythologically purity. Virginity. Yeah. She approaches his bed and she tells him that she'd like to talk to him about him and his girlfriend. And he gets really gross. And he's insinuating that he knows that Dawn has been waiting and saving herself this entire time for him. And he's just such a pervert, you know? Yeah. And he gets he gets more and more descriptive and gross. And so she slams the door and walks down the hallway and screams, which I think is funny. <laughs> Appropriate response. I mean, her home seems like so, it's like, has she had a moment of peace in her entire life? Like, <laughs> no, no, not at all. We don't see much from the stepfather in terms of personality until toward the end. The stepbrother is a uh, terrible abusive like her rising her yeah her entire life yeah yeah and then her mother is you know ill so yeah. yeah dawn invites toby to meet in the forest she's just like over it and has to see him and she tells him when he gets there that she brought her bathing suit i love that it's a sensible modest one piece <laughs> oh my god very posh yes <laughs> they uh frolic to the lake and i get big time adam and eve vibes for sure <laughs> uh, it's very garden of eden mm-hmm. after an uncomfortable exchange when they first see each other in their swimsuits they dive in and start splashing and they're playing and laughing and they uh kiss each other and yeah. toby remarks that this does not feel wrong at all and don takes his hand with the promise ring on it and she reminds Toby about their purity. I feel like she's reminding herself as as much as him. Too. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> she's very invested in this as well. And he's, you know, he's opened up to her. They have had a connection and he's been very sweet to her. Mm-hmm. They swim behind the waterfall 
into this beautiful moss covered cave and Dawn crawls out onto kind of a rock and covers herself with an old sleeping bag that's been left there by form like past lovers and all I could think was like how much cum that thing is covered in. (laughs) <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Toby climbs out as well. And, you know, he's claiming that he's freezing. And so they cuddle up close together. They're both wrapped in the blanket and they start kissing again. And it's getting more and more passionate. He lays down, she lays down on top of him. And then she suggests, actually, Toby, let's go back. But he starts kissing her breasts. And Don reminds him that they made a sacred promise and tells him to get off but he pulls his trunks off and starts forcing himself on her. And this is a really well done shift in tone for me Mm. to go from the kissing and the splashing and the, no, Toby, purity, to seeing what a monster he is. Mm -hmm. It's really her performance when she tells him, I am saying no, like is just so heart-wrenching for me. To, to sit through and watch and the scene just kind of goes on and on and on yeah it is you know I see why of course it was done that way because that is like it does make her this for the first encounter shall we say at least mm-hmm. you know because because that is like the quote-unquote like perfect victim like right like she said no she tried to push him off she said stop it's like all the things that don't happen on a lot of date rape <laughs> mm. because of you know conditioning and uh and whatever else but yeah but he i mean he sl- he like slams her head yeah. on the rock he covers her mouth and it like hits her head on the rock and she she like kind of out, out of it yeah and he's, like he kind of stops for a minute and then he's like great she's not fighting anymore <laughs> yeah And it's awful because when she wakes up, he has entered her. Mm -hmm. And it's like this realization on her face when she realizes like this this invasion of her body, you know? And I mean, and just of her spirit and trust, you know? He he tells her that she's still pure in his eyes. Mm -hmm. And then we hear a crunching sound. Mm -hmm. And Toby screams. And when he pulls away from her, they both start screaming. And their faces screaming, looking at oh each other, God. just goes on and on and on <laughs> as they both realize that his dick has been bitten off and is now laying on the ground. And we see it. We see the <laughs> dickless groin area covered in blood. And then we see the dick just on the rocks. <laughs> and it's a great prosthetic. The, the prosthetic oh, dicks in this are, are oh, gorgeous. <laughs> it's so well done. And he uh, screams and then he falls into the water and he disappears. And mm-hmm. Don cries in the corner of the cave. They really take time to watch this reaction as she realizes not only has she just been raped, mm-hmm. but like what the hell just <laughs> happened to his dick, <laughs> you know? <laughs> she calls out for him no answer and then she she looks around and notices the mouth of the cave is outlined with toothy looking stalactites or if she doesn't notice it we do you do rides her bike home and does not tell her parents what happened which is unfortunately far too common people not reporting this and she takes a shower there's a moment where she's kind of got her head down and her hands up Mm -hmm. and i I think she's praying there like that's how my mom used to pray in church and uh, yeah. yeah She goes to bed and she hears Toby's screams while she's picturing him in his tuxedo in her mind. And then the next morning she wakes up and she rips all of the girly childish decorations from her bedroom walls while Brad weirdly listens from his bed in his bedroom. Mm -hmm. Next day, Dawn is expected to speak at another gathering of the Promise Keepers. And this time it's creepy. I mean, it was creepy the first time, but this time it's like a surreal horror movie um she's not present at the microphone you can see shame she's dazed she's kind of talking nonsense and you know this like i said surreal this sequence is you know going back and forth i think between reality and a a subconscious experience for her but the kids that she's talking to like weirdly repeat things that she says like they're chanting they quote bible verses i think one of them that they chant is she shall be called woman because she was taken out of a man and She struggles to get through this, stumbling over her thoughts. And she says that there's something inside of her that's lethal. And then the kids say, the serpent, the serpent beguiled me and I ate. Mm -hmm. The teacher takes over, seeing that Dawn is struggling. And then (laughs) 
as she exits the stage, he says, well, thanks to Eve and the devil, we, and then that's the end. <laughs> but you see, and it's, it's out of focus, but you see his hand like gesture at her when he says Eve and the devil. Sure. Oh, <laughs> thousand percent. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I really liked the filming of the scene also because you can see it's just like handheld camera mm-hmm. when it's her beginning to speak. So it's like, it's kind of wobbly and it's like her, you know, just like she's not with it. She's, she's just had this incredibly traumatic experience, you know? Yeah, I thought that was, that was a really interesting scene because it's like terrifying. Yeah. But it's 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 almost like I don't know it feels like a they live kind of scene where you like see you're like oh wait that's how it really is that's actually what's happening yeah it's peeling away the layers of nicety around going to church and I'm speaking from someone who is dealing with religious trauma and is you know uh, handling that my own way and it's just kind of like okay these kids are reciting in creepy unison what they are told Mm -hmm. by authorities or by mentors joked about purity and they're also really young very young these kids are younger i think than the first batch those were like high schoolers these are definitely these are kids 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 there's like an after party for this event (laughs) and uh this this guy ryan played by ashley spencer comes up to don and she immediately says do you have a car did you drive here and we see him driving her home and when he gets to her place he asks her on a date and he gives her a business card and you think oh this Poor idiot. <laughs> like what it's, high school? This fucking nerd. Yeah. High schooler with a business card. <laughs> fucking nerd. Um, yeah, it's very cringy, and you're, it's like a bless. Oh, bless his heart moment. Um, <laughs> but she holds it and looks at it, and you know she's still she's still dazed, still processing what happened to her, and she snickers, and then she says, "That's funny," and it hurts his feelings, even though she then immediately realizes what she said, and she says, "You know, it's not you." And he drives away and he gets mad and he's like, what is so funny about it? And he turns around just dramatically and pulls up and goes up to the door to defend himself. And he knocks on it and he's ringing the doorbell. And then Brad answers. Because she gets out of the car and gets on her bike immediately to go to the park or the the cave or whatever. Oh, okay. All right. All right. So she's yeah, not she's even already, She hasn't even gone in the house. She's peace. She's out. Yeah. Love it. Love that. Brad answers. I love Ryan just like clutches his pearls, like his hand is <laughs> over his chest, like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> and Brad answers the door. He calls him a pussy boy and intimidates him. And then he punches him square in the nose. <laughs> like out of nowhere, man. Over the top. But it, weird possessive set where he's yeah. like, oh, you're going to Dawn? Like she's mine. Like there will be no other men here for her because first dibs, yep. basically. Yeah. yeah. So Dawn has returned to the lake. Uh, Toby's Jeep is still there and she swims back to the cave and she sees her a... clothes on. I was like, girl, come yeah, on. yeah. Anyway. It's gonna just be un- <laughs> you're going to be uncomfortable and soaking wet and, and gross for the rest of the day. She sees a crab eating the tip of Toby's penis that she'd bitten <laughs> off and she just shrieks. <laughs> and I wish I was like, where did that crab come? Is it a cave crab? But anyway, I get our lake, our lake crabs a thing. I didn't grow up by water. I grew up in Arizona. Oh, me neither. <laughs> um, she, uh, tosses her purity ring into the lake from a high up cliff. I actually love how it, it, uh, spins, spins, spins. And then it lands over like the ring r- lands around the camera as though we are entering a orifice perhaps. Am I reading too much into this? Maybe, but I mean, I loved that scene where you see her on top of the cliff and you're kind of like, oh, she's just like, at least I thought I'm like, oh, she's looking for a body mm-hmm. and then I was like wait is she gonna jump mm-hmm. you know she has all this shame and like d- you know her identity is in question now and and then you know she takes off the ring and I almost feel like that is a symbolic death you know mm-hmm. it's she's throwing away she's killing this person that she was before yeah yeah like and identity i can't i can't claim this identity anymore you know in the same body of water that toby presumably died in as well oh my god i just realized too she and brad when their babies are in a swimming pool it's another body of water mm. interesting mm. 
she goes home and she is soaking the page of the textbook that has the gold sticker over the vaginal diagram until the sticker comes off, revealing her first look at the illustration of the female reproductive system. And she's in awe of it. Mm. And I think it's a cool- look like she found the Rosetta Stone. Like- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't think she's ever, she's certainly never seen one, I guess. I would, ass- I would assume probably not even a, a picture of one. No. And then she kind of looks, looks down at herself and then back at it. And she's just in wonder, you know, mm-hmm. she instantly searches the internet. I think the website is called like web search. She, yeah, she, yeah. she types in female genital mutations and comes across information on vagina dentata. It's the, and we get a voiceover from her learning that it's the toothed vagina, which appears in many diverse cultures around the world. In each culture, the story is always the same. The hero must do battle with the woman, the toothed creature and break her power. Mm. She's upset and shaken at the image of an ancient statue showcasing a woman with vagina dentata. (laughs) She covers the screen with her hand. (laughs) <laughs> she learns that it's a nightmare image it's emasculating it's the fear of female sexuality and like the the um the male subconscious idea of crawling back into the womb and it's called it's referred to as like a, the dark crucible which is <laughs> so upsetting <laughs> she rides her bike to a gynecological office for an examination and... Like this is a very accessible town, first of all. Okay, anyway. seriously. Yeah. I mean, first, I guess they don't have any public transit, but everything must be really close. Yeah. Uh, right. When she's asked her name, I only noticed this today when I watched it again. Uh, when she asks her name, she actually uses Toby's last name. She says Miss Cobb. The doctor, Dr. Godfrey, played by Brad Payas, gets creepy when he mm. learns it's her first mm. time. It's, I... <laughs> He does a great job of being funny slash is this guy creepy, but we know yeah. that he's a creep. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. The, the line where he's like, he's like, oh, so you don't know what to expect. And she's like, no, not really. And he's like, cool. I'm not going to explain. Like you would think like the natural next stop for, you know, for walk her through it. Doctor, it'd be like, okay, well, this is what's going to happen. And blah, blah, yeah. blah. And he's like, cool. Great. Carte blanche. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, <laughs> Ugh. So she lays back on the table and he puts gloves on and he tells her not to worry. He says, I'm not going to bite you. Yes. <laughs> it's, oh God, like, it's, actually... <laughs> yeah. It's so weird. Cause he has her scoot, 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 scoot closer. Scoot, scoot. Well, that's like literally how it is though. Sorry. Is it? Okay. Well, <laughs> also this is a major medical violation that there's not a female doctor or nurse also in the room. So, Oh really? Yeah, totally. Mm-hmm. Okay, good. Well, I like knowing that. Um, yeah, <laughs> there should absolutely be more than one person in the room for an examination like yeah. this, especially with a minor. Like, how did a minor get in there? Right. Well, um, yeah. she also used a fake name, so well, it's Texas. Right. Never mind. I actually. I mean, well, would they okay. let it? Would they let a young girl go to an it's OBGYN right. anyway? <laughs> the plot continue (laughs) you're right you're right you're right you're right (laughs) dawn says that she just wants to be checked out down there to make sure that there are no adaptations or anything she -hmm. thinks there might be something weird going on inside and he says indeed there is it's womanhood (laughs) (laughs) he examines her and he asks if she's sexually active and you can tell this is not a question that like as a doctor asking a patient it's a pervert asking a young woman right because also that happens before like, right <laughs> yeah and she starts she says no and then she cringes and she says yes and he just stares at her like mm-hmm, he's like I, yeah that's i right. know what kind of girl you are <laughs> he removes one of his gloves and lubes his hand up before inserting himself into her quite forcefully and he makes the hand like as though oh, yeah. the entire hand like it's a fisting hand yeah four four fingers yeah Ugh. he tells her to work through the pain and you know she's really really in a lot of pain and you know she's like i can't i can't because he's like we need to test your flexibility Ugh. and then he tells her she's very Ugh. tight Ugh. then <laughs> suddenly he 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 like kind of catches on something inside and he, he says what well, what did you put in here? And then we hear the chomping sound as Dr. Godfrey begins so long. <laughs> screaming. Well, it's 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 a it's a scene I've never seen before because he is stuck in her vagina, yes. clamped down by teeth. So when he tries to pull away, he's dragging her all over the table. Yeah, yeah they're her. both just trying to get away from each other. <laughs> I'm really curious in the filmmaking process of this, 
what apparatus or harness they might have used that he was holding on to that would have caused her entire body to move. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm just, I'm, I don't know. I'm curious. <laughs> we hear the chomping sound one last time and the doctor goes flying across the room. Along with his four now separate fingers. <laughs> they have been bitten off and spit onto the floor. And Don runs away screaming and he's on the floor grabbing his fingers and he's just shouting, it's true! <laughs> Vagina dentata! Vagina dentata! And this is when the movie becomes full on satire. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's so good. It was so funny. I do think that could have landed really poorly after such an extreme scene of, of abuse and violation. And it, it lands successfully, in my opinion. But it's what you need in that moment yes. to be like, actually, like, because there's that catharsis mm-hmm. of like, screw you. Yeah. You know, and... And then of him just yelling like, Vagina Dentata! Just like, (laughs) yeah, great. (laughs) So Dawn races on her bike back to the lake where she sees the cops pulling Toby's dead disembodied body out. Uh, Before that, she's biking back and she thinks she's getting pulled over. Yeah. Because the cops her to move aside and she sees a cop driving uh, Tony's blue Jeep, the other direction. Yeah. So she's like, oh shit, something's going down. When she gets home, Brad is blasting loud music and we see him having anal sex with his girlfriend in the background while Don's mom is passed out on the floor and Don crawls over her to her. We cut to the hospital and Don has fallen asleep on her dad's lap and we hear like she's woken up by the sounds of crunching, like crunchy chewing. And then she snaps awake and she tries to go back home, but she can hear Brad and his girl. Uh, her dad tells her, you need to get some sleep, kiddo. Just go home. And when she gets there, Brad and his she girlfriend walks are- home. She walks. <laughs> Poor girl. <laughs> That's like, dad, give her a ride. Jeez. When she gets home, Brad and his girlfriend are screaming at one another. So she decides to go to Ryan's house because uh, he gave her, her his business card. <laughs> and she's in tears and she's saying that she's going to turn herself in. Side note, his bedroom is the garage oh my of God. the house. Yes. And I feel like that was his choice. He was like, oh, it'd be really cool if I lived in the garage. He has a black eye from getting socked by Brad. She's muttering that she killed him. And she tells Ryan about vagina dentata and that it's what's inside of her. And she's muttering like a hero has to come and conquer them. (laughs) The ancient Greeks, the Egyptians and Polynesians and Christians and Jews and lots of Native Americans. (laughs) As she like weeps in his arms. She yeah, and she a- tells him, she's like, I've killed one almost two. And he's mm-hmm. like, oh, uh, all right. Well, which should be alarming words, but she's a woman. So he's he's not going to, you know, he's take not it seriously. about that. Yeah. So she takes a bath at Ryan's. And this is our poster image, a very famous yeah. horror poster. Ryan offers her a pill. He like knocks and enters. And she, he says his mom takes them for her nerves. And she just without second guessing, like grabs it and puts it in her mouth. Pulls that soapy hand out of the water yep. and open all down the yep. hatch. Yep. And then she just continues to soak. I love the look on her face. It's just like, it's just what it is. Yeah. Uh, when she leaves the bathroom, Ryan has filled his bedroom with candles slash the garage. And he's opening a bottle of champagne. And she is kind of stumbling around and muttering. And Ryan tells her, oh, you got to be careful. Those pills might make you feel a little fuzzy. And we know well, what he he's done. her clothes. Yeah, she can't find her clothes. And she says, where are they? And he doesn't answer, of course. Mm-hmm. He sits her on the bed next to him and he starts pouring her some bubbles. And it's very clear that he has drugged her. Dawn looks around the candlelit room and she smiles sweetly. And she says, this is how I always dreamed it would be. And then she spills her champagne and the camera fades to black. Which that I was like, whatever he gave you does not mix with alcohol. So that's really great that she spilled that. <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do think the fading to black is a really clever trick of her fa- also mm. fading to black. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Who knows what has happened in this meantime because the camera, you know, comes mm-hmm. back into focus and now she's on her back topless and he is fondling her breasts. He puts a vibrating finger toy on his finger and uses it on her. She smiles. She's still drugged. And then he pulls a condom out of a wooden box. Every... Oh my god, his little toy box. I can't. Shut up. I, I, can you see in the background on that shelf? I have one too. I... <laughs> you still have one, okay? But like, what high school boy? I didn't have one <laughs> when I was in high school. Treasure chest. Come on now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Got it the same place as business cards. 
Yeah, exactly. Pulls the condom out and she welcomes the insertion and she tells him he has to stop. The teeth will get him. And he, <laughs> he tells her, I'm your hero. I'm going to conquer them. Mm-hmm. And she smiles and she lets him in. And mm-hmm. uh, we cut to a tooth. <laughs> the, the forensics investigators are investigating Toby's body and they found a tooth embedded in the penile stump, which is just a funny <laughs> pair of words. <laughs> the doctor remarks that it seems like it's related to like creatures like the shark or the ray, but it's also serrated. The lamprey. The lamprey. Is that, wait, do, what do you know about the lamprey? Oh, well, lamprey is like that. Those are those there. It's like the whole mouth of teeth that they latch on to sharks oh oh okay right yeah oh wow so this vagina yeah. dentata can yeah i got it all right the tissue actually proves that it's of human origin and so the doctors are perplexed by this mm-hmm. we cut back to ryan ejaculating inside of dawn and he squeals he's like ah, ah! <laughs> dawn can't believe that he's still alive and we 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 learned that when the sex is consensual her teeth don't bite. Now, by consensual, I mean she doesn't realize that she's drugged. Of course, but she also seems to be having a nice experience. Yes. Despite or perhaps because of, but like, you know, she's, he actually has, I mean, as, you know, we're going to find out not so noble intentions, but like, you know, he creates, even though, of course, like every, every dude, you know, it's this thing of like her brother and then this guy where she's like, hey, I, I'm having a problem and I don't have anyone else to talk to. And they're like, great, can I fix it with my dick? Yeah. <laughs> you know, which is such a common female experience of Jesus. like, hey, I'd like to talk to uh, this male friend of mine, you know, and they're like, oh, well, I don't really know how to fix that, but how about sex? You know, and so that aside. Which is so self-serving. Of course, but like, it does seem like, you know, two things can be true at once. And so, mm-hmm. you know, that may be a dangerous statement, but I mean, it's just life. But she does seem to have like a nice time, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. You know, whether, I mean, obviously, maybe, ooh, hold on. This is, this is. It's complicated. It's very complicated because of course, like. I, I appreciate that. Right. It's very complicated because on the one hand, like this would, this definitely qualifies as rape, right? Mm-hmm. He's, you know, he's drug tired and she's in a vulnerable, like traumatized state. But on the other hand, like she is able to enjoy herself in this moment. Mm-hmm. It appears, you know, where she's like, wow, this is actually fun, you know? Yeah. Well, it's rape, and but she doesn't know yet that it's rape. Yes. Yes. Which is so also common. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. especially when you're when you're young, um, and and things feel, yeah, you don't have that context. She has no sex education whatsoever, none, none at all. And this is the first time that a sexual experience has been uh, even remotely not traumatizing. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. And I think that's really it. Where it's like the bar is so low mm-hmm. that right, like anything that's not. Cause she's, she's been violently violated thus far. Yeah. This is the first time we're seeing that more complex, you know, what, what people commonly refer to as date rape, you know, where it's like, oh, it, it felt, it felt nice and it's okay. And then, you know, it's that thing where you maybe until you, you know, until you're able to look at the the situation from a clearer vantage point of age or, <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, not being under the influence of drugs that it gets, it gets not so nice. And it's, it's, um, we'll get to the end, you know, but th- it's mm-hmm. one of the reasons that I actually really love the ending of this film so much. Mm-hmm. We <laughs> interspersing comedy with really fucked up material. Mm-hmm. We see a downward shot of Dr. Godfrey having his finger surgically reattached. <laughs> And the the surgeon says, are you sure you don't want to tell us how this happened? And Dr. Godfrey just reaches for the gas mask and puts it over his own face. (laughs) At first I was like, wow. I was like, surgery, just just raw dog in surgery. Yep. But looking down at his fingers on the little tray, they they are kind of, you see, they're like the same shape as the dicks throughout this movie. Yeah. yeah, Don, we see Don standing nude in front of the mirror 
and she's examining her body as a grown up, like as a grown woman would. I think she's never seen herself like this before. I don't, she's probably never really looked at her breasts before, you know? Mm -hmm. She's kind of just turning and admiring it and appreciating it. When she returns to Ryan's bedroom, she says that she has to go to the police, but she's enticed when Ryan puts the vibrating finger toy back on. And we cut to her straddling him, calling him her hero as they have sex. Ryan's phone rings and he answers it mid coitus. Yeah, it's it's really strength three. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he boasts that he's having sex with Dawn and it's happening in the moment. And we learned that this was a cruel bet he had placed with a buddy to see if he could take her virginity. And he's so like, he tells her about it like it's something to be proud of. And, mm -hmm. Oh, your mm -hmm. mouth is saying no, but your pussy's saying yes. And in response to this, Dawn. <laughs> clenches down and bites his dick off and you can see it in her face like this mm -hmm. this like it's not even disappointment it's just like well fuck you know <laughs> well and i also i think this is the moment where she realizes what triggers that I, I it's still so. not it's still not conscious for her i don't think she is doing it but yes. she realizes oh this was fun and nice and that's why the teeth didn't you know activate <laughs> yeah and and then in an instant it was not fun and nice right and, and you can almost see it in her face where there's that realization of like oh this is this is what this is for yeah yeah for sure because she she takes a moment and then when she realizes or you know it, she says oh shit and starts to get up and <laughs> Uh, we see his blood spurting stump just squirting blood as he calls out for his mom and then he grabs the the dick and it's still got the green condom on it and he's just trying to like put it back on the the oh shit just killed her she's like oh shit yes. <laughs> it's yes. just like not again <laughs> and she opens the garage door while he's screaming in the background and she just she goes some hero and walks away <laughs> She goes to the hospital to see her mother as Bill, the stepdad, enters Brad's room and tells him he wants him to move out. This is a really, um, this I, I don't know, I struggle where this sequence goes. If it's toxic masculinity, mm -hmm. if it's, I mean, it's Brad establishing dominance as like the alpha of the house. But he and Brad get into a huge brawl as yeah. mother, the Rottweiler, barks in her kennel and brad's girlfriend is screaming in the corner brad lets the dog loose and it bites bill on the neck at brad's command we then get the same overhead view of a surgery happening and this time it's ryan in an operating room having his penis reattached and the doctor just looks at it and says hardly seems worth it <laughs> the nurse <is> snicker <laughs> And then we cut to a really sad moment we're in the hospital and don is crying over her mother's dead body and her mother mm -hmm. has passed away Back to Bill on his back in Brad's room. The dog is still standing over him. Brad tells him that he hated Kim, Dawn's mother, because when they married, it made Dawn his sister and that he loved her. And his girlfriend is like crying in the corner, having to listen to this. <laughs> but also that begs the question of like, what, whatever, we don't know what happened before the film, but it's like, what was their relationship before? It's like, he just like, chose this little baby right <laughs> when he was like five happened? or six yeah really weird yeah he calls the dog off of bill who is then taken to the hospital by brad's girlfriend <laughs> and don embraces him and then the girlfriend tells them <laughs> that the night that kim collapsed they had heard her screaming but brad said to just ignore it that she did it all the time and don's face <laughs> at the realization that her mother could have possibly been saved if Brad wasn't such a fucking monster. Mm -hmm. She knows what to right, do. She's just like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill that motherfucker. <laughs> yeah. She goes home and she puts on makeup and a white dress. It's like the silhouette of a wedding dress, but it's like casual, you know? <laughs> it's very every time. Yes. She enters Brad's room as he's smoking weed and he's watching an old horror movie about Medusa, which I thought was <laughs> really cool. Oh my God. She, do you notice she sees that it, she's like, Oh, Medusa, which also came up in her web web search, uh, internet research. <laughs> and she was reading a book about it. Yeah. I love this. Oh, and... I love this theme because Medusa was like blamed and yes. given this curse and it's her only defense against attackers. Yeah. But she looks at the television and then you see her face. She's kind of like, hmm. she's like, you know what? 
this is perfect. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad this is the last thing you're watching. <laughs> she's she's great in this. I mean, the whole movie. And I really love her in this sequence. She walks up to his bed and stands over him. And he's like clearly kind of wigging out from the weed. And the movie is weird. And then she he's just intimidated by her. Like she's he's never mm-hmm. seen her with confidence before. You know, uh, she sits on the bed and she just starts kind of like touching his face and then his chest. We didn't mention his disgusting sideburns and his trashy, gross tattoos, by the way. Full tattoos. Oh my God, the worst tattoos. Like strip mall tattoo parlor. They're like, like the ink is coming out of them. It's a really good detail. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, (laughs) He asks why she's doing this now. And she asks, are you afraid? I I love that. It was such a good neg. (laughs) Yeah, totally. It's brilliant. She straddles him on the bed and she starts to writhe. And he remarks that it's fucking weird. And then she goes, just wait. (laughs) (laughs) It's It's about to get weirder. (laughs) (laughs) The dog is watching from the kennel and Mm -hmm. uh, is getting antsy. The dog can sense something's up. Mm -hmm. Brad throws her off of him and then prepare, like turns her over on her stomach Mm -hmm. and starts to prepare to have anal sex with her, but she stops him. She gets real forceful and she flips herself Mm -hmm. over and she's like, no. (laughs) And she lifts her dress and is implying and insisting that they have vaginal intercourse. And he looks at her vagina in like stupefied wonder. Like he looks dumbfounded. He looks dumb. He's, I think he's looking for teeth. (laughs) He, he's checking it out to see if it looks safe he is the uh, the uh, the man who made up this myth and legend in every culture you know who's afraid of the vagina who doesn't know what to do with it who's afraid of powerful women you know he enters her and as she looks him dead in the eyes he's ugh, he says you see what we've been missing we always knew it would play out this way, didn't we? Ever since we were little kids. Ugh, ugh. And then it's a great shot. Great shot. Because he's touching the lips on her face with his scarred finger, mm. revealing her teeth in her mouth. Mm-hmm. And then we see a flash of them in the pool together as children. And he realizes where he got that scar. <sighs> lips, teeth, mouth, finger vagina dentata (laughs) puts it together (laughs) and before he can pull out we hear the chomping sound but she's like she hasn't bitten it off she's got him she is taking her time he is like what what was the animal that you said attaches itself oh the lamprey yeah like she's doing that not letting him out i just love the eye contact during Mm -hmm. this well and and so this is the first time she's doing it intentionally intentionally yeah and you see her like she's learning how mm-hmm. and also boy she's just making it last and that i also think it's interesting that the first time she's using this you know adaptation with intention is when she's getting revenge yeah that's a great point she finally dismembers him and he pulls away and he's writhing in pain and just making terrible sounds and she stands up and his dick falls out from between her legs and he has a prince albert (laughs) of course it's like the most insane like i don't know how you even have sex with that kind of period the the the, like crazy big ring that he had yeah (laughs) the dog is barking and the dog breaks out of the kennel and just picks up brad's dick into her mouth and he watches in absolute horror as this dog devours his dick even dawn is i just love when she just covers her mouth with both of her hands like what the fuck (laughs) and she's just like oh well (laughs) she turns around and leaves him alone she's got a a look on her face is like i can't tell if it's pity or um it's there's like a um not a sadness at moving like getting away from him it's just uh, a sadness maybe at the situation that she just yeah. had to put herself through well and i think it's he's like don't leave me you know and she just closes the Begging. door yeah and i think it's just like you can you can scream just like you let my mom scream yep. you know yeah the dog ends up spitting out just the head of the dick which all right, if they do attempt to reattach that, it's just going to be a nub. Like she, you know, there's inches and inches missing. Well, because the dog didn't care for the Prince Albert either. Well, and I actually read that a local bakery made the Prince Albert out of sugar so that the dog would not be harmed when it when, <laughs> when he put it in its mouth. Uh, so Don rides her bike out of town and those nuclear cooling towers that have been increasingly emitting smoke throughout the film, now we see the smoke stop coming out of them and dissipate. Mm. 
on the road, she encounters a flat and hitchhikes and drives off with a stranger. And at night, the car she got into pulls into a gas station. The driver we see is a the most disgusting, <laughs> creepy old man. Wakes her from sleeping in the passenger seat, and he's just got the grossest smile on his face. He's flicking his tongue at her, and she rolls her eyes <laughs> and starts to get out of the car, but he's fucking with the locks and won't let her out. And just his smile is so gross. He sticks his gross old tongue out suggestively. And she turns to face toward the camera, takes a beat. She comes to a, like this dark realization and a smile slowly forms on her face. And she turns to give the old man a seductive look and the credits mm-hmm. roll. And that is the end of the film. <laughs> I love that final look because her demeanor entirely changes. She realizes yeah. she turns, her eyes go down, her chin goes down and she just raises her you know her eyelids and it's just that like i'm owning my power now and it makes me sad too because like this is just what life is for her Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know it's like you're owning your power because you have adapted to having to do this yep and it's really it's like this fucked up you for me watching it at first i'm like oh yeah girl you get it and then i'm like no wait no no. Yeah. 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 It's not a, it's not necessarily, it's a, it's a satisfying ending, but not a happy ending. Great. That's um, exactly. Yeah. 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 I mean, you think about like the only male that she has known who hasn't been a complete horrible human is her stepdad. Yeah. And he's just been kind of ineffective at best. Completely. Yeah. You know, when he finally stands up to his own son, he gets his ass whooped. Oh, like, far too late. Yeah. yeah. Cause he even said, he's like, you should have kicked me out a long time ago. And he's like, yeah, I should have. Yeah. Fun fact at the end of the credits, it says, no man was harmed in the making of this film. <laughs> <laughs> and that's teeth, Evelyn. We did this. <laughs> I, I love you so much. And I'm so glad that you took the time to do this. We do have a rating system on Rick or Treat Horror Cast. And yeah. I know you know this. A movie is either a trick, which means it's okay. Right? Trick isn't a bad thing. A treat, which means you love it, or it's a smell my feet, which means it sucks. Evelyn. Oh, it's a treat. Yeah. It's a treat. That's the good one, right? It is. Yeah. <laughs> it is. It's a high, <laughs> high recommend. It's unexpected. It's unusual. It, you, there's nothing else out there like it. And um, yeah, agreed. Yeah. Agreed. I think there's been. Um, there's been some attempts more recently to do kind of like similar themes but I don't think they do it as well. Yeah. As this. Yeah. Yeah. The, there's a quirkiness. There's a tone. There's a, a shift in, you know, the direction so many times and, and frankly, a really strong performance from, from a lead actor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, like you were talking about the music, like I, I definitely noticed how, you know, it's like, it is that old, there's definitely elements of this like old school, you know, horror film. Yep. Kind of thing. We're like the like, dun, 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 you know, and I, I feel like it, it get, it helps with the almost campy side of it, sure. you know, um, but it also reminds you of like, of what you're watching and then the time with the other old movies that they, you know, put on the screen. It, it okay. keeps the, it keeps us in the loop that the movie is pretty self-aware because <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes. the the idea you know if you i i want to know what the pitch meeting for this movie was like mm. um mm. you know because, <laughs> because even i i have admitted my preconceived notions about what this movie was going to be about were completely wrong and i i think that right. the, you know things like the score and you know the excellent direction and you know the terrific script just lay out something completely unexpected mm-hmm. yeah. yeah and i think there yeah there definitely wasn't a lot like this in 07 no. at all no, definitely not. Definitely mm-hmm. not. Well, Evelyn, thank you again very much. Where can my listeners stalk you? Slash, do you want them to? Um, they may. Uh... <laughs> Don't have to. We can cut this. <laughs> it's actually that's actually fine. Um, yeah, come come to my Instagram, which is incredibly shadow banned. If <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> more than ten viewers every day. Um. 
though it's going to be um, a lot of like activism stuff. So, you know, be prepared. I think my listeners are the right, the right audience. Great. Then that's what it is. Um, yeah. So it's just Evelyn Devere. That's, a inst- that's Instagram, Twitter, though I'm not really on Twitter much anymore. Um, that's what everybody and- says every episode. <laughs> they like apologize yeah, for yeah, announcing their Twitter. It's sad on there. Um, and uh and yeah and then my website is just evelyndevere.com which actually i'm currently redoing um and so hopefully by the time this airs it will be visitable <laughs> i love it i absolutely love it you can yeah, follow yeah. the podcast at rick retreat pod on instagram and tiktok and x slash twitter or whatever youtube is rick retreat horror cast and it's taking off guys subscribe we're getting like thousands of views per episode it's insane to yeah. me and i'm really yeah. grateful and please check out my website because evelyn has worked really hard to make it a really beautiful and well like very accessible website to learn more about the show it's rickretreat.com and that's the show i want to take a moment to thank the team at Playwrights Horizons here in New York and wish the cast and crew a very exciting and successful opening night. Please get your tickets now. The show is going to be incredible. I want to thank Anna K. Jacobs and Michael R. Jackson for taking the time to share their insight about this musical and their experience and director Mitchell Lichtenstein for talking about his film and sharing insight about that. And Evelyn, you, I knew it. You were the perfect person to have on the show to talk about the plot of this film with. You are just a brilliant mind and I adore you. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. I'm so happy to see your show growing like a little flower. Thanks for the encouragement. Of course. And uh, that's it. We'll see y'all later, Spookies. Thanks for coming Rick or Treating. It'd be a real scream if you'd take a moment to subscribe, rate, and review the show on whatever platform you're listening on. The show's spooky intro and outro music is a cover of Camille Saint-Saëns' Danse Macabre, with orchestrations composed and performed by Lestat von Monlicht. My website, rickertreat.com, is designed and maintained by Evelyn Devere. The show's social media content is created by my evil minion and social media manager, Stanley Martin. The Rick Retreat logo was designed by Philip Romano. Contact information and links to these artists can be found in the episode description. Check them out, they're frighteningly talented. Rick Retreat Horrorcast is independently produced by me, Ricky J. Duarte, of Rick Retreat Productions. If you like what you heard, tell a fiend. I mean, friend. If you didn't, well, they're coming to get you, listener. 